Hello and welcome to the Wednesday, January 3rd, 2024 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Wrote a quick diary today about SH identification strings. These are essentially these banners that are being sent as SH clients are connecting to SSH servers. Both sides will send a banner. It's mandated actually in the standard that there must be a banner and how it's formatted. But aside from the SSH version beginning, it's pretty much up to the implementer what exact string to use. So I looked at our honeypots to see what SSH banners are being sent there. Well, lip SSH is sort of by far the most popular one. That's the standard Unix SSH library followed by Go. And Go is sort of interesting here. Go is not what I would call a super popular language, certainly quite popular. And one thing where it really sort of excels at is these multi-threaded clients and servers, which of course makes it a great language to write little scanning tools and such, which is why we see it so much here with SSH. But the real lesson I want to get across here is that you should track these uh, SSH identification strings, in particular as far as they exit your network. Not too much that you can do about those that scan your network, and sure, you have a ton of Mirai and similar bots doing it, but if you take a look at what's exiting your network, you may see, for example, some odd backdoor or a Trojan communicating or maybe just an out of a date version of a tool because for example for libssh and OpenSSH, the version number is included in that ID string. What I didn't cover here but also uh, good to keep it an eye on is the ciphers being used in particular with the recent Terrapin vulnerability in SSH that's somewhat cipher specific. You could, for example, check if you implemented the correct ciphers in your infrastructure or if you forgot certain hosts. And if you're looking for tools to actually implement some kind of monitoring here, I really like Seek for that. Uh, Seek's SSH logs are giving you everything you need to know about these SSH connections. And then a little bit uh, catch up from last week. Uh, We do have an interesting blog post I haven't mentioned yet by CloudSec. Uh, Pavan Karthik uh, did uh, publish this particular uh, blog and it details an interesting weakness in the uh, Google authentication scheme. Now, they're calling it here an undocumented OAuth 2 functionality. Not sure how much this is really OAuth what's happening here or really more sort of just regular cookie based authentication, but it does use an OAuth endpoint at Google called multi login. Apparently the purpose of this feature is uh, to maintain your login uh, with uh, various uh, browsers that you may be using. Now this is part of Chrome. So this would be various uh, Chrome versions that you run on uh, different uh, systems. And you may have noticed in Chrome, at least I know in the past sometimes, that it's sometimes hard to log out uh, from Google. And that may be a little bit related to the feature here. But the problem is that in September, apparently, attackers figured out that the cookies associated with this feature are persistent even if the user uh, logs out or if uh, the user then changes their password. And uh, over the months after that, like October, November, and uh, in into December, various malware versions, info stealers, did implement a feature where they specifically stole the information that is used to generate these cookies from Google Chrome's internal storage. So the end effect here is that the attacker will obtain a secret that gives them access to your session, similar to a session token, but these secrets are actually more powerful than your normal session token in that they will survive password resets. Uh, So if uh, the victim figures out that it may have been compromised, well, the attacker does not lose access if the victim resets their password. 
This often happens with OAuth where refresh tokens are not uh, being invalidated, but typically you will have at least the option then to, for example, check in your account that uh, what applications or so have access to your account and be able to invalidating them. The other issue, of course, is that these are valid applications. So if you are able and not actually sure if this would work here, but if you are able to see, hey, you know, uh, Google Chrome on my Android phone or so still has access, you may ignore that uh, because after all, uh, that's your device. Interesting little exploit here. Again, this is not a typical OAuth feature here. This is really something more special uh, for Google. Also, this feature was not uh, documented as part of Google's uh, APIs uh, for how their login works. And researchers from Tsinghua University in Beijing have uh, published a paper outlining some interesting new ways to use DNS resolvers as denial of service amplifiers. Now, we all know the standard uh, DNS amplification attack. Uh, they're still quite uh, popular, but this sort of puts a twist to it in that it abuses not sort of the ability to spoof IP addresses and spoof queries, but instead uh, just uh, standard sort of amplifying behavior of name servers, in particular retries. An attacker in the simplest form would set up an authoritative name server for a particular zone, let's say attacker.com, that advertises the victim's IP address as a NS record for that zone. If now other hosts around the internet are tricked into resolving that particular host name, they will send queries to the victim because they think that's the authoritative name server for this particular host name. And uh, well, since the victim will typically not respond, they will then retry various uh, queries and that can lead to some pretty immense amplification in particular if you're able to then sort of cascade this where the actual querying name server is asking a recursive resolver that will then branch out to ask multiple other recursive resolvers for the proper answer. There are some particular sort of oddities in the implementation of some DNS servers associated with this, in particular Microtik, Unbound, and Ali DNS, in addition to a couple others that are not named as far as I can tell in the paper. There are three CVEs that were issued for related vulnerabilities. Overall, there isn't really a lot you can do about this other than make sure that your DNS servers are patched, they're not contributing to this attack. If you find yourself the victim of this attack and you receive all of these queries for domains that you don't own at an IP address that's not even running a DNS server, well, maybe a quick workaround here, maybe to redirect those queries to a name server that uh, will respond uh, with uh, some IP address with a long TTL in order uh, to avoid any additional amplification and uh, queries. Well, and that's it for uh, today. Uh, thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.